I can't see. Can't see them. Yeah. I can see it. That's good. It'll go in. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Thank you for joining us for our fourth COSI of the quarter. So, my name is Kimberly. I see a lot of familiar faces. But for those of you who are new, um, I just want to let you know why we do this in the library. Here at the library, we think it's incredibly important. Um, that you have access to different opinions what, and different ideas, whether or not you agree with them. So you're not necessarily going to agree with everything we have outside of our shelves, and you may not agree with everything you hear in here, but we just ask that you are respectful of other people's opinions, that you keep in mind that we want to keep this a safe space, um, and that we are here to learn from each other. So please note that next week, history faculty Craig Schwartz will be leading a discussion entitled Will China rule the world? So, um, if you would like to organize a topic for the next year, I think fall is filming fast, so if you want to get in for winter, we have students, faculty, staff, community members come in and facilitate these. Um, but this week, we were all here because International Education Program staff member Christina Taylor will be leading us in a discussion around the prison industrial complex. So please help me join, welcome Christina. Uh, what was the title? International what? Oh, I work in the International Education Programs Office. Thank you. Um, program coordinator there. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm Christina Taylor, and I did my master's work on mass incarceration. Um, so I'll be taking a lot from just my years of research on the topic. Um, and it's a very big topic, so there's no way I will cover everything. So I'm going to touch on a few things, and then afterwards, with our conversations, if there's something that you want to talk about, we definitely can can go into it. All right. So yeah, this is what I just said. Okay. So I wanted to start this time this conversation on um, pretty much the myth that we've all been taught that slavery was abolished. There's a nice little exception to that amendment. So the 13th Amendment actually says that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime um, where the party shall be duly convicted shall exist within the United States. And I find it very interesting because what you have with this 13th Amendment was after slavery was abolished, how do you convince you know, southern slave owners and politicians to go along with this type of amendment if there's not a caveat for them? You know, so you have this exception here that pretty much it says that slavery never really went away. It's still, it's still existing today, just in a different form. So how many slaves do you think we have today mm. in this country? Just give me a number. Two million and a half million? Yeah, exactly. 2.2 uh, million. Um, over a million of those are for nonviolent offenses. Okay, so we have these millions of American citizens being incarcerated. Um, and I have a good, a good portion of that are for nonviolent drug offenses. And we'll talk a little bit more about our very failed war on drugs and how we got to this number. Um, and so break that down by race, if you will. Um, African Americans who make up about 13% of the US population make up more than a fourth of the prison population. Latino Americans make up 17% uh, of the U.S. population, but account for 21%. Whereas white Americans, who account for 78% of the country population, only make up 35% of the prison population. So I just pulled these numbers from the U.S. Um, Census Bureau. And so, you know, keep this in mind when, when we continue to talk about during this discussion. So this is just a racial breakdown of our numbers and, you know, who makes up our millions. So I wanted to, you know, talk a little bit about the state of Washington. Whenever, you know, we talk about the prison industrial complex or uh, racial disparity or sentencing, you know, Washington usually doesn't get on the radar. You know, we tend to focus on maybe California or southern states or New York, um, but Washington is not immune to this rise in incarceration. So in 1990, we had about 8,000 
So 10 years later, how many you think we have? Mm -hmm. 10,000? 10, no, I double it. I double, double it. it or double it. It's double easy it. double it. Yeah. Maybe more. Yeah. We have about 15,000 15, in 10 years. And 2009, that went up to 18,000. So we started off, I guess, modestly in the 1990s. Um, and you see that we have more than doubled that number. And, and and research has been done on that breakdown of that number, okay? So the University of Washington, they have a legal, a legal group um, from criminology professors and law, and law professors who actually broke down that number of incarceration in Washington State, and even they have this racial disparity. So uh, overwhelmingly, African-American population are incarcerated, which was surprising to me. I, I didn't even realize that. So whenever we use uh, the term prison industrial complex, Hmm? Yeah. What was that? The joint? <laughs> no, we're gonna, yeah, we're going to talk about that. So what does that term actually mean? So what it means is it's, it's describing these connections between private prison industries, which have a lot of political power, um, the rising U.S. inmate population, which is free labor, and these businesses that are profiting off of that free labor. So this is a business. <laughs> and a lot of things are connected. So whenever you hear the prison industrial complex, that's what, it's, that's what it's alluding to. And it also speaks to this promotion of building prisons as a way to create jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, as well as again, that inmate labor. So oftentimes you hear about private prisons being built, they sell that to states and citizens, you know, who vote for these things and who support these with their own tax dollars. You know, this is a way to create jobs and free labor. You know, uh, I think this journalist really touched on it a lot when he uh, wrote in the National Post that the prison industrial complex is a corrupt human warehousing operation that combines the worst qualities of government, uh, it being coerced, and private enterprise greed. He states that the inmates are kept in inhumane conditions, which we'll talk about, and the need to preserve the economic advantage of a full prison, which we'll talk about as well, uh, which leads prison leaders to draw any effort or reform that might reduce that in prison rate. With private prisons particularly, for them to function, they have to maintain uh, at least 50%, sometimes 90% occupancy rate. So if my prison that I am creating in the state, for it to make money, I have to keep it full. Yes. You know, so then it doesn't become about, you know, getting the bad guy or rehabilitation, it's about making money. You know, so we'll, we'll talk about that. So uh, uh, one major explanation for that sudden rise in, in prison rates is the failed war on drugs. Okay, so the war on drugs it started in the 70s, um, and then President Nixon, he, he made a huge national platform that the number one, public enemy number one, are drugs. And we need to get these drug dealers because they are, you know, eroding the American fabric. And so, Politicians ran their platforms on tough on crime policies. You know, so you couldn't get elected unless you had a policy that uh, was tough on crime. And so it was a national campaign, and it basically introduced military intervention, okay, um, and a reliance on drug enforcement agencies to hand to prohibit drugs, not to treat it, not to rehabilitate, not to address drug addiction, because at this time you had the war, you know, to Vietnam. So you had a lot of soldiers who became addicted to heroin and cocaine mm -hmm. weren't getting any treatment. We just gonna lock them up. And so by the 80s, arrest rates rose from 28% to 126%. And by the 2000s, we had over a million Americans being arrested for drug offenses and one in five African Americans being incarcerated for drug use, for drug laws. Now notice that with the reason why it's considered a failure because drug use hasn't gone down. Okay, we, the drug didn't go away. We just keep incarcerating millions upon millions of citizens. Oh, and another thing on the war of drugs, what I found interesting, y'all know who the show Cops? Mm -hmm. So the first episode of Cops was a drug raid mm -hmm. in the house. 
And the first lady at the time used that as her platform. And so she was actually along on for the ride. And there's actually a video of her coming out smiling after this drug raid. And you have the men being, you know, uh, in handcuffs behind the back laying on the ground after this drug raid into this crack house. Mm-hmm. Crack house, okay? So that's the first episode of Cops. And it's still reoccurring. That's the whole platform of that whole show. So you have this whole uh, media uh, national movement on stuff on drugs. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I was just wondering, was that uh, during the Reagan administration? Cops. Was, yes. right? was that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was. Right, you're right, you're right, you're right. But yeah, that was the first lady so platform was to be part of, you know, the eradication of drugs. And so she was along for the ride. I, I, yeah, I saw that video and it really made me, uh, <laughs> So, um, a population of uh, inmates that really don't get enough attention are the women in prison. So we have a lot of, um, news stories and panels and research on the men in prison. There's a lot of research out there about that. But what um, I like to bring light to are the women in prison. Between 1980 and 2011, women in prison increased by 587%. Ooh, Okay. To yeah, to 2011. Yeah, from 15 to over 100,000 um, women by 2011. And the reason of this Right, well part of the reason is, so whenever you have the, the war on drugs, you're getting all these low level drug dealers, but also that are being arrested are the women surrounding them. So if they're living with their mother, or if they're living with their girlfriends, um, or if they're benefiting any type of way, um, if your drug dealer nephew bought you groceries, you know, that's a problem, and you can fix that same time. And if you don't know that they are selling drugs, or you don't have any clues on the detail of an operation, you can't cop for a plea deal. You know, you can't get leniency, you can't really cooperate, and so you often will get, women will often get longer sentences than the active drug dealers, because they don't know anything. You know, they're affiliated. You know, so you have this huge number of women also in prison at a rate, at a much higher rate than men. So currently we have more than one million women under supervision of the criminal justice system. So when you have women, you have mothers. It is another area that don't get talked about. 62% of women in state prisons have minor children. So what happens to the children when one or both of their parents are in prison? You know, so with the, with the amount of women and amount of men we have in prison, we now have a generation of children being socialized already in knowing about incarceration, knowing about the cops, knowing about the courts, knowing about jail, things that really shouldn't even be on their radar, radar their kids. One in 25 women in state prisons and one in 33 women in federal prisons are pregnant when admitted. So if you've seen the flyers for this talk, it was a woman who was pregnant behind bars. Pregnancy does not immune you from being incarcerated. Um, so what happens when a woman gets birth in prison? Hmm. What do you think happens? They take the baby. They have to take the baby. They somewhere. take the baby. What happens when she has to give birth? Do you think she goes to the hospital? No. No. Uh, oftentimes they're shackled. And I actually have a report from the Human Rights, um, yeah, United States Human Rights, International Human Rights Clinic, who wrote about shackling of incarcerated pregnant women a human rights violation committed regularly in the United States. Mm-hmm. So what happens, I think you said that around. So whenever it's time for a woman to give birth, she at times is handcuffed to a bed, go to the medical ward, but by her uh, wrist, her ankles, and maybe even her stomach, and she has to deliver her baby like that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there, the guards are there, the men are there, and she has to deliver just like that. Mm-hmm. And in the report, they call it torture because that's what it is. She can't move, it's uncomfortable, and there are witnesses, people, women who have gone through this, whenever they protest or you know, want to move, they are gagged. And so Washington, Washington has a law and policy that restricts shackling, but it still happens, and it's not public, so there's no oversight. Right. Not, yeah, recently, you know, a, few, a few years ago, Shack, uh, Washington was sued by a woman who was shackled. Did she win? I think she did. 
But it didn't change it not being published. You still don't know what the law says. Right. And so in that report, they actually, it's very extensive, they actually uh, went state by state to see if the law was public, what's the wording in it. Because even if a state has a law, if it's not a policy, those private prisons and those public prisons can do whatever they want. Because there's no oversight. Nobody's there managing to see if they're shackling or not. And the whole idea of shackling women came out of this idea that there had to be uh, equal treatment for men and women. So we're not going to look at the special needs of women. We're going to treat everybody the same. So even if you're giving birth, you are still going to be shackled to your bed as if you were going to run away during labor. What do you think the laws are not public? Yeah, they're not public. Um, if you can't, you can't find it on, online or it's not made available to the public. Huh. So you, there's no way for an average citizen to look at it. So what I hear you saying is you can have a law, but if it doesn't become policy, then you can do what you want. Yes. Then I think, well, that's another kind. I don't even know if we're limited on time, but then what are the laws for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially if you can't, there's no oversight. Yeah, for anything. Yeah. There's a lot going on with the state's Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I definitely wanted to talk about the happening <coughs> issue, because that's Paying some att attention, but not nearly enough. Um, another consequence of our prison industrial complex is the loss of voting. And this was done on purpose. But there are currently 6 million people in America who cannot vote. So if you are convicted of a felony in almost every state, you will lose your right to vote, sometimes for life. You know, so it's not enough that you pay your debt to society by serving a time. For the rest of your life, you can't vote. Yes, yes, that is very true. Some states will allow you to appeal. It's a process, but some, and, and they're trying to get that back. Um, but the fact is, an overwhelmingly nationwide policy is problematic. Uh, well, I'm a felon, and I got to vote, so I don't know if it was just the state of Washington, but yeah, I mean, I can't get the vote in this past election. Yeah, it, it does vary by state, um, and, it, and it could very well be the state of Washington. Um, me being from the South, it's not. Yeah, you have to go through some things. And most states, in, particularly in the South, I know in Florida particularly, you get that a lifetime ban, you know, if you have a felony conviction. But that's, again, that's one of the things that is being worked on. So we'll see what happens in the future. <laughs> um, but right now, this is still in effect. So I did want to talk about the finances of this whole operation. Right, and the impact of those finances on the actual inmates and their families. So, once an uh, inmate leaves prison, oftentimes they have to pay a, a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, payments to probation departments, courts, of course, child support, courts and services, mandatory drug treatment and testing, all of that are fees and all those things have to be paid by the uh, inmate once they leave, by the you know, person that leaves. And there's more, pre-conviction. So let's say you get arrested and you have to spend a night in jail. Before you even go to court, before you are convicted, you have fees that you have to pay. So jail booking fees, jail per diem, uh, pre-trial detention. If you opt for a public defender, there are application fees that you sometimes have to pay. Um, bail investigation fees to determine the likelihood of you be appearing at trial. This new no, I don't think that's new at all. And how will they pay them? That's a great question. How do you pay that? <laughs> if you can't get a job, right. Sometimes they can't pay them. So what happens if you can't pay them? You get longer sentences. You get your probation uh, altered. Um, and if you get a future job, those wages can be garnished. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> Oh, and there's more. So even though they say it's free, that you're getting the help, you're actually not paying it. No, that's not free. Like, in the future, you have to pay Yeah, you have to pay for these. Yeah. And just, like, not being able to pay for <coughs> your drug testing, if you're on probation, they can, like, send you back to jail if you can't afford to test. In the long run, that, it's especially that part of your probation. You have to do that. So if you can't afford it, or if you can't fulfill some part, some obligation of your probation, you 
de yeah, you definitely can go back to jail. Post-conviction. So once you leave, pre-sentence report fees, public defender's recruitment fees, work release programs, those have fees. Um, if you're on parole or probation, those are, there are monthly fees. So you, can, you, know, you have to pay to be on probation. Um, and again, failure to pay these are additional control sanctions, change in your sentence, uh, garnish wages. I actually saw an um, interesting episode of Lock Up on MSNBC, MSNBC, and the inmate, he was going to his probation hearing, and they, they offered him probation. He said, no, I don't want probation. He went back to the jail. Because <laughs> the, 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 the thing with probation, not only do I have to pay all of these fees, I'm essentially on lockdown for another year. Or I can just do my time, and when I leave, I'm gone, I'm done. You know, so what I mean, <laughs> the fact that an inmate chose to stay in jail as opposed to be on probation, you know, it's problematic. It, make, it should make you think. Do they know that they have to be here? Do they tell them that all of that is not, you know, like, over-breathing? Do they tell them that after that, you know, you have to pay? They may once you get arrested, <laughs> you know, or whenever you, especially if you're doing jail time, you have to sign out a lot of stuff. So they may tell you that. Let them know when they're leaving and what the conditions are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Phones. This is a good one. So phone calls, just to talk on the phone is not free and you have to pay for that. The average surcharge for a prison phone call is between four to five dollars. And most companies charge 90 cents per minute. So a 15 minute phone call can, call can charge can be about 18 dollars. Real story, I got a phone call one time. This person kept calling my phone, and so I answered it. It was from a prison, and I accepted the charges. They don't tell you how much that charge is, though, before you accept it. Um, and so I answered the phone, and I told her, you know, she had the wrong number. Um, less than a minute conversation. Got my phone bill for that month. That thing cost me $12 for less than one minute conversation. $12 for the fees for less than one minute conversation. Um, cost me $12. Now imagine if, you know, that was a relative, you know, as a mother or, you know, your child or a cousin or an uncle, you would want to talk to them, especially if they're away for years. And the uh, families every year spend close to $400 million on phone fees. Okay, so this is big business. This is big business. And so recently, we've gotten some movement on um, these crazy costs for phone companies. Um, and so some states are cracking down on these, these companies charging so much for a phone call. Um, but again, this isn't often a topic that is discussed. Let's talk about private prisons. A big part of the prison industrial complex are these private prisons. So there are two major private prisons in this country, or companies, the CCA, Corrections Corporation of America, and the GE Group, Inc. The CCA has over 60 private prisons in the country, and they're under federal investigation now because of abuses of their inmates, um, <laughs> just a lot of other stuff. But that hasn't stopped their growth. They just opened two prisons in California. You know, they're making millions upon millions of dollars and they're under federal investigation. And so together, how many do you think facilities we have in this country from private prisons? How many facilities do you think we have from private prisons in this country? Does that include uh, non-penal facilities like immigration detention? Yes, yes, including immigration detention. We have close to 100. Again, California just got, they just have an expansion from CCA, and um, the print isn't really clear, and the GEO group just um, inked a deal with them to open up a prison for $9 million a year to house less than 300 female inmates. So it's a business. And we're not immune. We have our own private prison in Tacoma. So the, the INS, uh, Immigration Services, uh, got, has one of the biggest immigration centers in the country in Tacoma. 
and they receive $162 per day per detainee, so up to $350. And beyond the $350, they get an additional $25. And their agreement is that it'll be at least half full. And it hasn't gone down. So it started at a 500-bed facility. So even under conservative, super, super conservative invest, uh, estimates, they can make at least, at least $12.5 million after expenses, but they're making more than that. Is that a year? Yes. Do you know the size now? Okay. Well, they can hold up to 1100 um, but that doesn't include people that are being processed through it. So they can hold 1100 but they can also, um, people can start there and be shipped elsewhere. Um, so they recently uh, declared $30 million in revenues. And again, it started off at 500, but then it expanded to 800, and now it's at 1100. And a notable contributor I found out are, is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They invest 2.2 million dollars in the in our private prison in Tacoma. And there was actually a recent protest in front of their building recently, um, like last month, for them to divest from the private prison. And when asked about it. The rep was basically saying, we give so much money in scholarships and we have so many investments, this is our way that we give back. That foundation is a multi-billion dollar foundation. They could find a better use for a $2 million investment if you ask me. But when you say give back, is that developing programs within the prison system itself? No, because no, no, this is an so integration. Point, if I were to hear that, mm -hmm. I would think, oh, okay, good, so at least you're providing them with some kind of education. No. So it's just to invest and keep that thing going. Yes, yes. And this is the immigration. So there's, there's no program for immigrants that we're trying to support. How was it that they tried to defend, defend it? I, I noticed the title of the article. Yeah, that's basically, that's basically what they said, that our investments help us create all of these other programs and scholarships for all of these other people, you know, for young people to go to colleges and so that's how they try to flip that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they just recently, a group recently got Wells Fargo to, di to divest some of their money. So they, they Wells Fargo divest, are, are invested in private prisons, GEO, you know, particularly. Um, so, exactly, exactly. Yeah. 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 But again, I think we should hold I think we should hold everybody accountable for this. Yeah. Especially if, you know, we're getting scholarships and receiving funds and they're doing you no, know, they are doing good work, Bill and Melinda Gates are doing yes. good work. They can find a better investment than yeah. GEO. Oh definitely. <laughs> So, speaking of our own Tacoma facility, uh, I actually have a few articles on um, the hunger strike that just occurred last month. Um, so, in state and federal facilities, an inmate can get uh, 25 cents an hour, maybe up to a dollar, if they're in a good facility for work. <laughs> At these private prisons, they only get a dollar a day, and they can be forced to work for 12 hours. So, across uh, several states, including ours at our Tacoma facility, um, the inmates decided to do a hunger strike. And they were, um, it lasted for about a month. And they were uh, striking against being shackled, uh, excessive compensated prices, those phone rates we just talked about, um, and solitary confinement. So, in the face of their complaints, and most prisons have, you know, a complaint uh, thing. So if a prisoner wants to file a complaint against an officer or something, they can go through the proper channels. And whenever they complain, they would sent to solitary confinement. And a lot of them would just deport it. And this just happened recently. So um, I mentioned a little bit about solitary confinement and 
I was reading up on it, and not, that's also considered a torture mechanism from the international human rights. But an interesting statistic is that uh, between 50% and close to 80% um, of inmates sent to solitary confinement suffer from mental illness. So now we're using incarceration as a means to deal with our mentally ill you know, citizens. So we don't have to worry about actually helping that or drug addiction or the illiterate. We just incarcerate them all. Um, it actually speaks to uh, a quote from um, Angela Davis. Homelessness, unemployment, drug addiction, mental illness, and illiteracy are only a few of the problems that disappear from public view when the human beings contending with them are relegated to cages. You know, so we're not forcing anybody to deal with these issues because you know, we are so reliant on incarcerating everyone. Who, who, who did the first quote? The first quote is by Douglas Blackman. It's a slavery by another name. Uh, in this brave new world, punishment for the original offense is no longer enough. One's debt to society is never paid. So I have a few, there's only a few, very few. The Sentencing Project um, is an online database. They do a lot of uh, research on the prison industrial complex. There's a lot of reports on there, interviews. So that's a really good uh, research if you're interested in learning more about it. A few books are up there. Um, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. She talks about um, mass incarceration um, from the 60s to now. Even Seattle, Washington gets a little spotlight in her book because of how, uh, how much we incarcerate. A Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman is a good one. I can have a few of them over here. He talks about the re-enslavement, uh, particularly African Americans from the Civil War to World War II. So again, after uh, the Civil War, again, how do you um, convince these, Southern, these Southerners to go along with the abolishment of slavery? You said you, you, know, you can abolish slavery except as punishment. And so that's when you have the original, the first rise in incarceration, right? And you have the beginnings of the convict leasing system. So at this point, uh, again, this is post the Civil, post, um, the civil War. So with the convict leasing system, you basically, it's a chain game. You know, so you incarcerate all of these new, the new slaves, the new free, the freely slaves, you just reincarcerate them all and put them back on the bills, or back in the warehouse, or laying, you know, train tracks. And so he goes in depth about that. And there's some other good ones. Uh, Jeffrey Ryman, he wrote a really good book on the rich get richer and the poor gets prison. And his whole theory is that the criminal justice system was never intended to rehabilitate. It was only intended to create an image of who the criminal is. And by reinforcing that image, the country would be comfortable sending those many people to jail. Not only that, they would police themselves. You know, if I can convince you who the criminal is, I don't have to really worry about them because you're going to do it for me. So he writes a really good book on that whole theory on what the criminal justice system was originally built for. I also have another book over here by Paula C. Johnson, Inner Lives. She interviewed 30 to 50 women in prison just to hear their story, how they got there. Um, so that's really, really, um, I, it's really eye-opening. You know, who, the stories of who we are incarcerated, so getting beyond the numbers their individual stories. There's some books over there. Um, they're just, they're, there's just a lot when you're talking about the prison industrial complex. We didn't even talk about mental illness. And that's a, an area all by itself. Juveniles, you know, the, the school to prison pipeline, um, that's a reality. Um, so you have all of these tough, tough policies for school children, and then there are immediately sent to juvenile detention. And then that, you know, in, you know, definitely impact their futures. Um, so this is just, again, a small portion of it. Definitely want to give you, us plenty of time to do some conversations and to ask any questions. So that's all I have prepared for you guys. Thanks for listening. Thank you.
seen that the article has come out, and I think a series. Oh, I won't reveal names, but um, you know, right on this issue locally mm -hmm. and statewide. Yeah, this is a under the rug type of an issue, you know. Uh, it's very interesting. You know, University of Washington just released their study on uh, Washington State's imprisonment. Um, so that's online if you were interested. Mm -hmm. Washington, you know. Yes, right now it, it, well, yes, it has recently, but I definitely plan to expand that because we are seeing, especially with our immigration, so we are seeing a uh, more diverse population being incarcerated. Um, but for the purpose of this short conversation, you know, and my research in grad school, we have narrowed it down. But yeah, absolutely. About... Can you speak up for the interpreters, please? Uh, she asked if there is um, a quote, a link where she can look up the multicultural uh, inmate incarceration. Uh, the sentencing project may have some stuff on there. The sentencing project, um, they really do up to date around the clock research. Mm -hmm. You can definitely start there. What was the name of that? The sentencing project. Sentencing. Yes, sorry. Just get the slur. <laughs> The sentencing project. When we talk about multicultural, um, what are we actually talking about? All people of color? I use that term as just a catch-all basket. Um, Population can be African American and Latino, period. You know, 
but that's really good to go in deeper into that. Yeah, because we African Americans, we can all say we are some shade of brown. Right. right. And when you get the other um, African populations over here that do not necessarily associate themselves as a right. black American, right. you're still, your skin tone is still brown or black, some tone in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think they have a little plan there. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Did you have any hand up? Um, I was wondering if you had like any information about what happens to youth after they're done with duty. So like if they're 16 mm -hmm. and have like a three year sentence, they get 18, do they get sent to prison? Or do they actually stay in duty? No, they get sent. Okay. Um, and there is actually, um, uh, it's over a thousand uh, juveniles who are serving their sentence in adult prisons. Yeah. Yeah. So they get sent. <laughs> yeah, you being young doesn't they doesn't they do. Yeah. Sometimes the age limit can go down as far as thirteen, and it can be sent to the adult prisons. Adult prisons. Yeah. 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 There's a movement to
Um, and, and even though they have commuted some of those sentences, and even though prisoners can now um, apply to be released, you still have two brand new private prisons in California which going up with already agreements so that they have to be full. Right, so these people are going to come out and you've been released great. Where are you going to do that? Where are you going to do afterwards? Because we see your record, and it's just one of those things, you know, we're not supposed to, but how can we say? How yeah. Can you prove it's so now you're out on the street, you may or may not have a home, but if you become a, you get caught up in the system mm -hmm. again, and what's the next track? Right, and that's another thing. So once you are released, especially if you have a felony conviction, that's on your record. And you can't qualify for a lot of social services, so you can't qualify for food stamps, you can't qualify for unemployment, you can't uh, live on um, a government housing. So if your entire family lives in governmental housing, you can't go home. And then the people that you go home to can tend to be arrested if you do go home. This is after you serve your time. Mm -hmm. You can't, you don't qualify for financial aid, so you're supposed to educate yourself somehow. But first you have to find a place to live. First you have to find a place to live. You need to eat. Your basic needs have to be met. So yeah. how are they addressing that? Are they addressing No, they're not. They just let you out and... Yes. We'll see you in a They, they let you go good. with the money that you had in your pocket. Wish you all the the best. So they don't yeah, take they your do. money? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. I would say so. That's the real skill. An organization here that was initiated by a man who had been incarcerated, and it's called Post Incarceration Program, something like this. I have not. Okay. I may not have the right to No, but I'm going to look that up, though. Okay, because he himself and that's what it's going to take really these organizations communities you know doing the rehabilitation rehabilitation ourselves you know welcoming our neighbors <laughs> our family members ourselves because it's a slow start for the government to take to do it yeah, I don't do that. Well, it's not even a <laughs> but in terms of youth getting out um, they, they do their time and say I don't know they're finished so they might not necessarily have to go to prison because they satisfy their juvenile sentences. What happens to them after that? Because obviously they're 18, mm -hmm. and some kind of family may or may not want them back. What is there something for them? Yeah, do you, I uh, I'm sure I can answer that. Okay. So as of February, a um, law just got passed called the Youth Opportunity Act, and I don't know if you all know about it, but okay. basically. When you have a criminal record, when you are a minor, when you turn 18 in Washington State, it will not get erased. Because okay. it's start pretty much what it seems like. That's great. Excellent. So, yeah, if you want to look it up, it's called the Youth Opportunity Act. And you just got signed in um, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. So, and that's happening in several states. Yeah. So after you, so if, if you have a good juvenile record, it's expunged. Yeah. Or so it's closed. So. Even if like, you serve time in juvie, like, it's pretty much kind of like a clean state. I do have a question. Oh, did you have a message? Oh, I was just going to go off by her because I know that, like, um, you said they just, they just started. Yes. It was yeah, because they used to, them. if you had your juvenile record, they added it with your adult record, which made you oh, get wow. more time. Oh, wow. Yeah, so you have a long, you have a big, fat, fake sheet here. <laughs> and I told the record, too. Like anybody who's ever served time, you can easily look up the offender's uh, search list. Picture will come up, their information, how long they've been in prison, that's all public record. Yeah. But do, do you know if, um, if you really offend, do, do they bring you back up? Oh, no. no they they if you uh, if like you really get sealed, so it just okay. it gets um, sealed and it's like yeah. out, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a super cool law that just got passed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens if your name if a criminal record comes up in your name and you did not do something. Oh, that's a difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that yeah, I've heard I've heard of that happening a few times in the news. Uh, but that's just yeah, you just have to get to clear your name or provide evidence that that wasn't you. Yeah. My husband had to stop a few times in the airport because his name came up <laughs> a few times and he had to like tell them where they live. I think we have time for one more question. Um, yeah, I want to say something with the women in prison. 
delivered children. So when they get out, is there something for them to bring the family back together? Or when you go to prison, if you have children, the, the family member takes it, do they go into the system and yes. go to foster care? Yes. When you come back, can you retain your family? It's a process, and it's a long, lengthy one. Um, there, are, it is, there is an agency um, to help women get their children back, but there is so many blocks to that, that it is very difficult. Um, and the baby that was born is Christmas, so what happens then? They go to just take that baby and put it in a foster care? Yes, or a family member. Mm -hmm. Or they go to the Thank you everyone for joining us. Let's thank Christina. If you'd like to learn more, we have some resources here for you and we can also help you find some answers to some of the questions you had about uh, different links and resources for people who have come out of prison. So if you could take one of these great little surveys to tell us what you thought, what you'd like to see, what's important to you, we'd appreciate it here at the library. And have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Thank you all. They have the